earth, sea, and everything in them. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You know, John, I, I'm glad we're out of the Sanhedrin, but it is really unfair that they're going to tell us we can't talk about Jesus. I don't know about that. I mean, we, we're going to be all right. I think we just got to pray it out, and God will help us, man. Let, let, let's pray, uh, Peter. Heavenly Father. We well, would... before we really get into that, though, John, like, I think I need to call my attorney. Yeah, he's really good with free speech stuff. <laughs> he's never lost a case. Look, we don't need an attorney. We've got the ruler of all things. Why don't you just, why don't you pray it out with me? Why don't you just lead us, man? Come right. on. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll help me get in touch with the media. I'm calling John. I'm calling the media. I'm going to call Tom Terry at the news station and tell him what the Sanhedrin's doing. What does he know about anything? He's a meteorologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Look, uh, even a meteorologist can help us with this. We need God, so well, let me try praying. Lord, um, I just pray that you give us strength to John, to boldly. John, I know what we need to do. What? Social media. I'm going to tweet at Elon Musk. What is he going to do? I mean, <laughs> freedom of speech, man. He's going to be like out there telling like, hey, you know, come on. This is the way they got to be held to account. Look, look, let, let's don't forget. Pray, man. Just... <sighs> All right. Dear Lord, I'm just so sad and upset right now that I'm not even able to pray. I'm just going to have to go be with my feelings. <laughs> I mean, it probably is not too different than that, right? <laughs> I think it's much more natural for us when we have been told we can't do something and we've been offended at someone telling us, then we would, we would fuss up a storm and uh, employ anything we can do to restore our rights rather than to stop and pause and see maybe God's engineering something uh, that we need to be a part of in, in this mix. If you've been here the last several weeks, we talked about the sort of shocking results of Peter and John doing a good deed of healing someone that was lame from birth, and then the fallout from that was a being rushed to the highest court in the land, and then being threatened within an inch of their life. Now, when you have a close call, there's different reactions. I read about a close call that's about the closest of calls. It was in 1979 in May. And a man named Dennis Watley was running late to his flight from Chicago to L.A. And he got to the gate, and they just closed the door. The flight attendants and the assistants would not let him on, and he was so mad. He begged and urged, please let me get on that flight. And they wouldn't let him, and so he gets in the long line to, off, to file a complaint as well as to get his, his travel rerouted. While he's standing in line gets the horrible news that Flight 271 from Chicago to L.A. had crashed. And at that time, it was the worst crash in U.S. aviation history. 271 people lost their life. And here this man in line is about to complain about it. He decides, of course, not to do that, and he doesn't even reroute his travel. He saves that ticket, and if you ever remember airplane tickets in 1979 it was different than a little app on your phone it was this big old thing and he said he placed that ticket in his office as a reminder that every day is a gift from God and he said that whenever he would go through something difficult at work he would look at that ticket and remind himself that God had preserved him and God had kept him alive and kept him here for a purpose you may not have had a call that was that close but maybe you've had a relationship that was teetering on its last hind legs and God has restored it or maybe you had a horrible health update and the Lord brought healing or maybe you were almost in an accident or almost something happened some people react to close calls by being extra careless eh, I don't ever get in trouble I don't ever die when I get in a close call so I can just live on the edge others the pendulum swings the other way when they have a close call they get so cautious that they're walking on eggshells for the rest of our life, of their life. Now, how are we supposed to respond to a close call? 
I believe that the disciples have some insight for us today in the way they responded to their own close call. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 4, 23 through 31 today. And I first of all want to read verses 23 and 24 where we find these words. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now, verse 23 is normal, right? They went and they gathered their friends together and they told them what happened. I really wish we had a transcript of exactly what they said. Um, have you ever had a, a, you know, a bad experience somewhere and you gather your friends together and you tell about how you were mistreated and about how rotten these people are and you sort of want empathy from your friends? Have you ever been the friend that listened to the story and you didn't quite get mad enough about the story? <laughs> Um, I, I don't, I mean, we want empathy. We want someone to be as enraged as we are about our pain. And it's difficult to sort of see what they said because the next thing is verse 24 and a prayer meeting breaks out. They just tell you, we were arrested, went to jail for healing somebody, and then they threatened us to, now it's illegal to preach about Jesus, so here we are. What did they do? Well, in verse 24, they started praising the Lord. First thing that comes to mind is really sweet, sensitive friends, right? <laughs> you tell them your trouble, and they just say, we want to praise the Lord for that. But it's a great reminder to us, the first principle this morning on your outline about how to respond to a close call is, number one, join with others in praise. Some of you may not feel like you have your band of brothers and sisters that you could call up in that moment of trial and share your concern with them and then come and pray together and seek the Lord. I think that most of you probably have more brothers and sisters that would do that with you than you realize. We tend to not be as vulnerable as we are. We don't mind telling somebody when good news happens or when something amazing happens, but when we're having those difficulties, we... We're a little bit hesitant to let the word out. But when we do take that step and we let others into our world, it's important that we gather around them prayerfully and as God would lead also with praise. Look at the content of what they said in verse 24. It said they, first of all, they said, Sovereign Lord. Now the word sovereign here means absolute master. The word sovereign has the word reign in it, which means to rule. And sov meaning over all. So the one who rules and reigns over all all things. That's what they praise God for. In other words, Lord, you were sovereign over the death of your son. You were sovereign over his rising from the dead, and you're sovereign over giving us a commission that got us in jail, that got us threatened. We praise you because you're in control when good things happen and when bad things happen. Now, they got out of jail, and they, they thought he was sovereign over that, but if they go back into jail, they're going to believe he's in control of that as well. So sovereign, master, and Lord means whatever happens, I'm going to praise you. And then they said this, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now they praise God for being the creator. I think you and I forget that God is the creator of all things. I remember uh, at a wedding I was at a few years ago, my great niece, who I've not had the privilege of being around a whole lot, we kind of reconnected family weddings and those kind of things. And a little Sarah was her name, and she was probably three or four years old and the cutest little thing. And I was just, she didn't know Uncle Cliff was, but after me pinching her cheek for a, probably a couple of days, she was ready for this uncle to go back to where he, wherever he's from. And uh, I was just sort of messing with her. And I squeezed her little face and I said, you have a lovely face. Where did you get that face? She also didn't know that Uncle Cliff is also Pastor Cliff, so she took a moment to teach me a few things. And when I said, where'd you get that face? She looked at me and says, oh, God made me. She's like, don't you know? I mean, we're <laughs> I'm not some cosmic accident here that just popped into existence. I really loved the way she spoke. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 God made you, and I assume that would be me as well, right? Here's the thing. I realize that to believe in creation is way out of step with society. But let's just think for a moment. Do you think that 
the natural explanation of our world is all that sensible? That nothing created everything? That nothing, by the way, I forgot to throw in some random chances and a bunch of time that nothing creates everything. That doesn't make me want to worship at all. Does it make you? <laughs> no, but the fact that there's a sovereign Lord that in Genesis 1 and 2 spoke and creation came into being from the very word, from the very mouth of a creator, that makes me want to worship. And if he created everything, that means he is over all aspects of his creation. And that very reality should lead us to praise and to worship. When's the last time you praised God for creating you, the complexity, the complex body that we are, the complex world that he sovereignly spoke into being and that he reigns over? That was reason enough. I think that's an odd time to bring those things up right after they're getting out of jail and threaten not to preach. But any time is a good time to praise the Lord and to remember and to frame your prayers around the size of your God. We often pray puny prayers to a puny little bitty God, but they begin to proclaim God for who he was and his greatness, and praise erupted from their hearts. Now we see something else that happened in verse 25 and 26. There's a second thing that they do, and and it's that they got into the Scripture. They didn't have a Bible study, but the Scripture was in their hearts, and it flowed out of their mouths. In verse 25, Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. That phrase, the anointed, means the Messiah, a reference, obviously, to Christ. So, as he's praying he begins to remember the Word of God. And the second principle this morning about how to respond to a close call is number two, keep a scriptural lens on life. In other words, view and see life through the prism and the, the very lens of Scripture. Now, a, few, a few years ago, I started needing reading glasses, and I like me a, I like me a dollar store pair of reading glasses. Anybody out there, my people? Yes, all right. Great buys there. And I, about a year ago, I think I, <laughs> I think I fussed in a sermon about a year ago that I was required by the DMV to uh, get prescription glasses for driving. And I didn't pass my eye test, and so I had to get those. Now, a dollar store reading pair of glasses I found is, well, the prescription glasses are a little more expensive than that. And I found out uh, the hard way their, their expense, too, because uh, a few months back, one of my sons from college was coming up, and he had car trouble, and so he got towed, and I met him very late at night at a local garage and got him in the car. And anyway, when I got out of the car to go greet him, I threw my, my prescription glasses in the car seat. And I came back after I picked him up, and I sat on the reading glasses. Yes, you're, you're concerned for those glasses because you know I'm not the lightest of framed person. <laughs> Some of you are going, oh, those poor glasses, are they okay? <laughs> no, they are not. <laughs> and so I picked them up and put them on, you know, they were, they were looking great. I am thankful. If you sit on your, reading, on, on your prescription glasses, then uh, make sure you don't crack the lenses, just the frames. I saved a little money with that. Anyway, for a few days I had to put, you know, they had to call in new frames and so the glasses, I would tell Mrs. Lee, I don't need these things. I don't know why they're making me wear these. And I didn't have them for a few days. And guess what? I missed those lenses. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so they're pretty good. Yeah, so I can see a little better with them. When I got them back, I was like, <sighs> now, you and I are supposed to, as believers, view life through the lens of Scripture. Our problem is we would rather not do that a lot of the time. You know why? Part of it is if, if we view life through the lens of Scripture, it's going to convict us. And there's flat some things we don't want to be convicted about. We like our sin just fine. And if we're to look at the Scripture about life, it's going to convict us and change us and challenge us and no thanks. And also, I believe that sometimes we really don't want God's comfort at some trials because we would prefer to be angry and bitter and to clench our fist in the air at Him. And so we refuse the Word of God or at least leave it to the edges of our soul in the midst of our pain. But not these disciples. Matter of fact, 
the, the, the apostles begin to quote Psalm chapter 2. And I couldn't recommend for you just to pull out a psalm, any psalm, most any psalm, in your hour of trial. It has been God's balm of the soul of many believers through the years to give them unexplainable comfort. And notice what he says about it in verse 25. Who through the mouth of our, ho- of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. By the way, what kind of view of Scripture did the apostles have? Right here, they said that the Holy Spirit inspired David to write Psalm 2. So you know what they felt? They felt that they were reading God's Word when they were reading the Psalms. And I hope you will begin to view the Word of God that way, that you won't say, this is a nice religious book that's supposed to give us some principles of life, and then at church they tell us we should read occasionally. No, no, no. It is the very Word of God. Some of you might say, I I wish God would speak to me. Well, He will if you open that Bible. Because God breathed and preserved His Word. Yes, He used the human instruments and authors, but He recorded what He intended to say, and it was breathed by the Holy Spirit. And specifically, they asked the question, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plotted in vain? The kings of the earth, they came and inspired and plotted against your anointed one, Jesus. Do you know what they're saying in Psalm 2? There's going to come a day where people are going to rise up and they're going to take Jesus Christ out. The disciples are seeing this going, ah, okay. So the persecution was planned and known by God long ago. It must mean that we're going to be all right. God's not gasping up in heaven. And the scripture reminds us that life is going to be hard as a follower of Christ. We will make it. And he will see us through. And they only responded that way because they had the balm of the spirit-inspired words of God. I remember reading a story several years ago about a missionary that was driving a plane, a small prop plane, dropping loads of Bibles in Cuba at the height of their communist revolution where Bibles were illegal, and his plane crashed. It got really low to the ground and then crashed, so he was not injured, but Cuban police grabbed him, threw him in a jail, for, and he was there for some 18 months. And they did not pass out Bibles like they do in our jails. They passed out all the communist and socialist Marxist literature that you wanted. So he's in there trying to witness for the Lord, and all the only Bible verses he had were those that were in his mind. He said that they would try to write verses on toilet paper to remind themselves of the Scripture, and then the guards would steal that. One day as he was reading through and thumbing through a communist book, One of the authors quoted Romans 8.35, which says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the only scripture verse they'd found in any of the other books, obviously. And he gathered his friends together in jail and pointed that verse and said, We're going to look at this verse every day. And so they, they, they didn't check that book out. They kept it in their cell, and they read that verse over and over and over, that even though we're in here, nothing can separate us from God's love, even a jail cell. And their souls were comforted as they looked at their life through the lens of scripture as the prayer continues we read in verse 27 for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant jesus whom you anointed both herod and pontius pilate along with the gentiles and the peoples of israel so now as they're praying they're recounting that a few weeks earlier christ was crucified and it and herod allowed it and pontius pilate also okayed it and then there's sort of a stunning God word aspect to this in verse 28 and it says this to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place so in verse 27 Pontius killed him Herod killed him Jesus is dead and then in verse 28 there is a reference that all those things were under the hand the sovereign rule of God and the plan the very specific acts of decreed by God that he had predestined to take place. Now the word predestined it shouldn't scare us as much as it does. It bothers us because we can't reconcile the decisions of man and the trials of life with a plan that's already picked out in advance. But destiny is uh, the future. And if there is predestiny, it means that someone went into the future in advance, predestined to make things happen. And this can keep us up at night. I want to point out something about God's predestining wisdom. We don't have to fully understand it to see its beauty and its value. 
There's a lot of things that we don't, have to, that we don't understand, but we know that there, there's good in them. Think about this for a moment. Your hearts were broken, as was mine, on Monday when we heard about the shooting in Nashville. While the stories that came out ended up being more of a battle over social issues, there was detraction away from the, the sheer sadness and tragedy of the loss of three children and three workers at the school. And I remember hearing a report about it on Monday that, or I, actually one of the reports I heard was Tuesday that said, more information is developing on the story. And there was a Christian news analyst that said, we have an insatiable desire to understand things. But when we don't understand things, we must pause and hold and trust God anyway. The fact that God has a predestined plan that doesn't have a nice little bow wrapped around it with perfect explanations for all of our trials and the sufferings of this world doesn't mean that God is not governing it. What it does mean is when our understanding is limited, we don't check our brains at the door and says, fine, no big deal. But what it means is we have to yield our insatiable desire to understand everything to the sovereign wisdom of God. Now, the second principle on your, or the third principle on your outline this morning about how to respond to a close call is number three, and that's this, to steep your mind in God's sovereignty. Now, you know what it is if you make a glass of tea, you steep the tea bag. And the longer you keep the tea bag in there, the hotter the water, the more strength and flavor you'll get from it. I, I remember talking to a friend of mine one time whose uh, sister was a missionary in a remote part of Africa where they could not get tea bags and said that there was a Sunday school class at church that sent them tea, but there was one lady in the class that sent, that collected her used tea bags and sent them overseas. Way to give your best for Jesus, right? Can you imagine these ladies, they're opening up these and they're putting these steeped tea bags that didn't have any flavor left in them? Um, I kind of feel like we use steeped tea bags of God's sovereignty to form our view of God's control. But if, when the water of your, hot is bo- of your heart is boiling over with trials, I want to encourage you to place the sovereign character of God right in that boiling water. And the calmness of his reign can permeate your thinking. If your life is steeped in the reign and rule of God, you will be ready for your darkest hour. It doesn't mean that you will understand or even like your darkest hour, but you will have the amazing arms and hands of God holding you up, supporting you with the scriptural truth of his reign. Last Sunday night was a really difficult night for one of our beloved church members. Sunday morning, she and her new husband had, they, they went to, they sing in the choir at Village Park and at the downtown campus at 945. I did her first husband's funeral six or seven years ago, and she embraced widowhood with such faith. And then I had the privilege of doing her wedding two months ago in this very room that we're in right now. And it was one of the most joyful, fun celebrations of love I've seen in a long, long time. Tragedy struck her home as she sent me and a few other church leaders a text that said, Bob has passed away. There was um, complications from diabetes and heart issues that suddenly took his life. And we went up to the, the ER room where she was clutching his deceased hand. And she was weeping as I haven't seen uh, anyone weep. And she was saying, this is not right. God, bring him back. As we talked and prayed for a moment, she looked up at me and said, Pastor, I cannot blame God for this. Because I know that God knows what he's doing, but I do not like it and I do not understand it. And do you know what I liked about that? I actually loved the honesty that had been steeped in the sovereignty of God. I don't think we're called to screw on a smile and act like we're enjoying suffering. To, almost to deny, no, this doesn't affect me. I'm, I'm a believer in Christ. No, it was rocking her world and ripping her soul out as it should. But there was, a, there was the very much evidence of the strong sovereignty of God that was holding her together in her darkest hour. And I'd like to encourage you to steep your soul in the fact that God rules. There was a quote from Randy Alcorn in his book, Hand in Hand, that I found very helpful on this particular passage. It says this, Herod, Pilate, and the others acted according to their sinful nature. 
Likewise, God acted according to his sovereign nature, using their sinful choices to accomplish what he already decided should happen. God holds a man accountable for the sin they choose to do, but listen to this. He says, but it is not inconsistent with him to utilize their low-purposed, finite evil for his high-purposed, infinite good. When you believe in the sovereignty of God, if natural evil happens to you because of the fallen world we're in, or if evil happens to you because of the poor choices of others, you still are convinced that God can bring good out of it, out of his plan that has been predestined in advance. Here is one imperfect way to picture it. Imagine a husband and wife that started a business that had some success to it that were ready to retire. And so they hand the family business over to the kids who run it. While mom and dad are alive, they'll make final decisions. But the day-to-day decisions are out of their hands. So if the kids do well, they'll do good. If the kids do poorly, since they have the day-to-day decisions, there's really not much that, that the old man and his wife can do. He might come in to try to mop up a few messes, but there's... Only so much he can do when he's yielded control. Some of you are going, have you been reading my mail? Could you finish up this story real fast? Okay. Now, imagine God runs the company he created called Earth. And he's given us the freedom to make meaningful human decisions. Some of the decisions we make are good. Many of them are bad. Unlike the mom and dad that couldn't do much about the poor choices of their kids, The living God is able to come in and use good choices we make, bad choices that we make, and the awful events of this world to come in and accomplish something that no human can do, and that is to keep his ultimate will on course and for his people to actually bring great good out of it. Our problem is that that we all we look up and God's weaving this beautiful tapestry that he can see the plan, but we look up and we see the knotted yarn of his current workings and we stare at the knots and the tangles and we live a life that says if only God had done this if only this had happened and that brothers and sisters will drive you crazy but if you will ever steep your soul in the fact that God rules over all things and that he will do what his hand and plan has predetermined to take place then a life of faith can be born now In in the last three verses, 29 through 31, we see the disciples making specific requests, and they're praying big prayers to a mighty God rather than little prayers to a minute God. And so the fourth principle is this, how to respond to a close call, pray big prayers. And the first type of prayer is A under number four, and that's this, pray big prayers of Boldness. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Think about what got them in trouble, what got them in jail, what got them threatened. It was preaching the word. If this is you and me, do you think this prayer is showing up in there? I'm thinking, now nah, I'm glad we took a stand for Jesus, but I think it's time to lay low. <laughs> it's illegal, mind you, so let's just lay low. No. They prayed for more opportunities and for more courage. What also strikes me is they didn't seem like they were timid at all. But they knew that they were timid. Peter was a Jesus denier a few months ago. And so he says, Lord, give me that inner power to share the good news. Because now it's harder than ever. There's now an edict going around that this can't be done. And I will fold without your boldness. I want to commend Acts 4.29 to you as a prayer you should pray for yourself. I discovered this prayer after I realized how chicken I was to bring up Jesus to people. I was on a mission trip my freshman year in college, and one of the things that we were asked to do is break up in groups of two, walk around to people in the mall, and pass out tracts and talk to them about Jesus. I'm not saying that's necessarily the most effective way to present the gospel, but it's probably better than not sharing the gospel at all, which is what most people do anyway. So... I remember going up and sitting down next to a guy who was sitting on a bench in the mall. He wasn't there shopping. He just looked like he was doing nothing. And I kind of said hi. He said hi. And then I'm sitting there going, yep. All right, I'm about to say something. I turned to him and almost said something four or five times. I turned away. 
And there was a guy who was a couple years older than me that was kind of one of our team leaders, and he said, how's it going? I was like, I can't seem to say anything. And I had this big yellow streak right down my back. I said, why don't you say something? And so I got up, and I watched him do it. He tapped the guy on the shoulder and said, hey, sir, my name's Randy, and I'm out here with a group from Texas, and we're going around the mall passing out little booklets and talking to people about what Jesus has done to our li- in our lives. Do you have a few minutes? Do you mind if I share with you? I was like, yeah, 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 I meant to say that. That's what I was trying to, <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. Why didn't I say anything, though? I was thinking that, one, I was going to say something really stupid, and then as soon as I said it, this guy's going to get really mad, and then the kingdom of God is ruined forever. <laughs> I just ruined everything in God's work. Well, I found out that, yes, some people don't like it, and if they say, no, I don't want to talk about it, then you should probably not talk about it. But a lot of people are interested, at least they appreciate the moxie you showed, and if you have a gentle, compelling way of what God's done in your life, it's going to sow some serious gospel seed. And I left that moment thinking, Lord, I need your boldness. And I found through the years that the, to the degree that I'm praying something like Acts 4.29 or Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, asking God for his courage, he grants it to me. And that inner power you need to actually get the conversation going begins as you ask God for it. In verse 30, we see another thing to pray for, a, a big a pray. Uh, Pray big prayers, B, for the miraculous. Look at verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So a few days ago, Peter stretched out his hand to heal a lame man. And now in verse 30, he's praying for God to stretch out his hand to heal. There's a fine line between asking God to use you and asking God to show up and be the center of attention. Some of you know the joy of being used by God in some manner. You have spiritual gifts that he's given you, and you are filled with joy when God uses you. But there's a subtle tendency to making being used by God all about you. And Peter knew that tendency and didn't want that, and so he said, Lord, you stretch out your hand to heal and then to show signs and wonders. We've talked about before how signs and wonders are more prevalent in the book of Acts and they're more prevalent in unreached areas because God used the signs and wonders to arrest people's attention to get them to listen to the gospel message. I don't think we should ever infer that we should not pray for God's miracles in our day. Habakkuk 3 2 says, Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day, in our time, make them known. And I I think sometimes we get away from praying for the miraculous because we assume God would rather not do that, and so we don't. And we settle for a low level of the power of God. But I want to encourage you to find the person that is the most distant from God of anyone you can think of and pray Acts 4.30 over them. Maybe think of the most unsoiled and unreached land and the difficult, the hardest soil there is and pray for that people group or that area of the world Acts 4.30 on them. I oftentimes think of the biggest challenges in our church, and I ask God to do miracles in the midst of those challenges. I'll never forget, there was a man, a young man from China. This was in the late 90s, and I was a college pastor at a church in West Texas. And there was a guy that grew up in a big city in China, and he was an engineering student, and he said he had never met a Christian there. He'd never seen a Bible. He'd never seen a church. Only thing he knew about Jesus was what he had read in the communist history literature that he was given at school. And he comes here and starts going to an international student Bible study, and he, everywhere he looks, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he was, his name was David, and he was hesitant to give his life to Christ because of the worldview that was so anti-God. I'll never forget him calling me one day. He goes, Cliff, I believe in Jesus now. And I was thrilled. And I said, what happened? He goes, I'm trying to go to sleep last night, and as I'm sleeping... Jesus appears to me in a dream and said, David, why do you resist me? Repent and believe. Now, dreams don't save people. Miraculous experiences don't save people because of the miracle. A lot of folks saw miracles of Christ and they didn't believe. But he'd heard the gospel so many times before the dream that he gets up out of bed, kneels down by his bed, and invited Christ to come into his life. You know what that made me want to do? And first of all, it made me want to shout and clap and praise the Lord. I think some of you want to do that. 25 years later, let's, let's thank God for that. <laughs> but 
It also makes me want to pray for God to reveal himself in powerful dreams and signs and wonders in our day. Lord, renew them in our day, and so shall it be. And the last verse I want to look at before we pray is verse 31. It says, when they prayed, the place they were gathered together was shaken. Similar events to Pentecost a few months earlier. This also means maybe it's a sign of God's approval. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So once again, they were governed in the Spirit of God as they trusted Him. And they continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Do you feel like some of your prayers take a long time for God to answer? A lot of times He's just doing, answering His timing in His way. But this one was answered quickly. They prayed for boldness in 29. And in verse 31, they receive it. So... But notice this. It says they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. The boldness came as they talked about Christ. Your courage, your answer to prayer may come as you step out and act upon your prayers. Don't let prayer be a reason not to act. So the last principle is C under number four, and that's this. To pray big prayers, C, that lead to action. Combine obedience to your praying. 